So welcome everyone and the topic is um, for today a like and dislike has been requested by Pan actually just before so um, to go into like and dislike and to uh, understand how like and dislike arise and what liking and disliking actually causes um, I'll try to walk you a little bit through the process that happens before liking and disliking actually arise. So in our life, there are merely six things really that are happening continuously. First of all, they're all happening within the realm of the present moment. The future is a thought, the past is also it's just a memory, it's a thought. There's no actual future, no actual past, anywhere to be found, but in our heads. And um, so within that present moment, there are six things that are active, more or less, at different times. Now, the first thing is your eyes. You see. So there are your eyes. There is what your eyes are seeing, namely colors and shapes. And then there is a consciousness that has to also connect to the eye. These three things. That's the first. The eye, the eye object, and eye consciousness. Now, the second thing is the ear. The ear object and ear consciousness. So we have these two already. And it's always in numbers of three. The sense organ, the sense object, and the sense consciousness. Then you have the nose. The object of the nose is smell. And what makes it possible for you to smell is that you're conscious of the nose. So there has to be nose consciousness also. And the fourth one is the tongue, taste, and tongue consciousness. The fifth one is the body, then tangible objects, and the consciousness of feeling in the body. And finally, we have the mind, then mental objects, and mental consciousness. All right? So these are the six things that exist. You could also say the 18 um, sense faculties. Because it's six times three things, right? You have the sense itself, the sense organ itself, then the sense consciousness and the sense object. These three always. Not so, uh, not so difficult. Really, we all know the five senses already. Uh, you add the sixth one in this uh, kind, of <clears throat> kind of way of putting it, right? There's these six senses. The sixth one is the mind. Here, the conditioned mind. Now, when those three come together, the sense object, the sense organ, and the sense consciousness, then we call that contact. That's called contact. The Pali word actually is pasa. So when your eye is meeting with a color and you're conscious of it, then it's, there is seeing. It's called contact. That's the first step on our journey here, okay? This contact. This is our first step. This is the first thing that we start with our contemplation. We are starting here. There's something easy that we all can do. Nothing complicated. Forget the philosophy for a second. Your consciousness goes to your eyes. That means you're seeing right now. You're busy seeing. Suddenly the consciousness goes to your ears. You suddenly hear something. 
then suddenly the consciousness goes into your body, you feel something. That's all that, it, that this means. Okay? So contact is the first thing. After contact, immediately, the second factor arises, our second step on this path towards liking and disliking. Immediately after contact, there is what we call feeling. Now, I'm not talking about the feeling in our bodies, like that we usually say, the, the tangibility. But I'm talking about what is called Vedana in Buddhist terminology. It's called Vedana. Vedana means it's almost like a, sort of like a taste to an experience. A good example maybe to give would be if you have a movie and you see the movie, you see like, uh, let's say, a man talking um, on the phone with another man. Let's say that's the movie, okay? And then you have some funny music in the background. Okay? So there's this, there's this funny music. Now, it gives the music, it, it gives the movie this kind of funny taste. Happy. It's happy. Man is talking on the phone and you put a happy music, it feels like it's a happy thing that is going on. It has this kind of happy taste to it. And happy atmosphere, you can say. And now you have the same scene, a man talking on the phone. Now you put like a sort of a horror, horror music underneath that. Like a very kind of a threatening, pulsing music. And you know something is up. The scene doesn't have changed at all. It's the same scene, it's just a different music. It gives it a whole different taste, a whole different feeling, right? And then you have the same scene, but no music at all. Kind of very neutral, just a man on the phone. So these are our three types of feelings. Three types of Vedana, which is pleasant, unpleasant, and Neither pleasant nor unpleasant. These are the three types of things. You could also say neutral. Okay, so we have contact. So far, this was our first step. Our sense organ has made contact. Let's say our eyes are seeing our neighbor. Contact. You're consciously seeing the neighbor. Now there is a feeling coming to that. And maybe something has happened in the past with your neighbor, so you don't really like your neighbor. So upon seeing your neighbor, the seeing is then imbued with mm, horror music. Doesn't feel really good to see your neighbor. You see that neighbor, it's just a person, it's actually just seeing. But for you it's not because you're looking through the filter of feeling. Feeling has arisen, you see the neighbor, immediately followed by that. It goes so fast, it's lightning fast. Immediately there's a feeling with it. You know that when you go through the city, you can observe it for yourself. You see different people, you feel different things, right? For some people you have more generally a happier tone, it's called Sukha Vedana, a pleasant kind of sensation. For other people, even more unpleasant. And for other people, you don't feel nothing. There's no pleasant, no unpleasant. It's kind of a neutral state. But you can observe this for yourself. The same, of course, is true for all the other senses. Sound, smell, taste, feeling, and thinking. A thought might arise in your mind and you don't like it. You feel, sorry, we are, that I, I went too far a little bit. This dislike is a bit further down the road. Now, here we're still here just with feeling first. There's just a feeling. A thought comes up and it, it has this feeling tone to it. It's not so good. Unpleasant. Thinking about you have to do your taxes by the end of the month. You have to file your taxes. Ah, man, I have to file my taxes. 
So that, that thought arises in your mind and it doesn't have a pleasant feeling to it. Notice. And then, a bit further down the road, after contact and feeling, the next factor kicks in right away and it is craving. Now we come to the point. We come to liking and disliking. However, craving is rather, in a, in a way, it's, it's like an energy that manifests. So the, the energy of dislike, of course, is you're resisting. There's a sense of resisting what has arisen, right? Or you have the sense of trying to hold on to what has arisen because it's pleasant. So you try to hold on to, make it bigger, make it last longer. Right? Or you try to get rid of it. So it's the craving is that very first impulse of energy that either makes you push against or chase. Okay? So this is liking and disliking. Now in these three steps, this is how it builds up. First step, contact. Second step, feeling. Third step, craving. Now we have an option of training our mindfulness. And if you're training your mindfulness, it can kick in at either one of those stages. Because contact is happening every moment, every second. Right now, contact is happening. It happens all the time. Each time there's a sense is firing off. All the time is something going on, right? Thinking, hearing, seeing, feeling, like that. Constantly buzzing between these senses, these six senses, all the time. Notice it right now as you're actually listening to the talk. I make a, a short pause. Where does your attention go in the pause? Do you have to force your attention to go there? Or does it just go there automatically? So we all have these kind of inclinations of our attention. It goes now here, now there, due to our inclinations, due to our kind of our personality structure. For some people, the attention goes continuously to irritating things. Ah, I hate this one. And then we see all the time these irritating things are arising. We constantly have contact with irritating things. Because it's this kind of irritating um, fundamental personality. It's, it's easily irritated. Wherever it goes, the, the six senses, they happen in the context of the irritated person. You have a depressed person. Then the six senses, they function in the realm of the depressed person. Then everything is seen in the context of me and my depression. We see uh, something and then we feel, oh, that's sad. And someone else might say, no, it's great, it's fantastic, look at this, it's beautiful. You go to a beach, for example, and uh, some people see the trash, others see the waves. And some people then, when they see the trash, upon seeing the trash, there's dislike, and then the story continues, and they blow it up. That shouldn't be the case, should not be there. And we start with clinging, that would be the next step down the road. And we start clinging, it becomes more and more intense, more and more um, problematic. Which then, in, in turn, feeds and nourishes me, the problematic person with a lot of problems. See, that's how it works. And this is actually what also kind of keeps the world spinning the way it does. It spins. Me, the problematic person, I need to find a solution for my problems. 
But as long as the problematic person is walking through life, it will encounter problematic events. No matter how many times we feel like we need a solution and we need uh, to find something more uplifting and I need to be more positive and whatnot, it doesn't really work because it's the problematic person doing the walk. So if you want to, anyway, if you want to change something fundamentally in your life, then you have to be present not as a problematic person and then start from there. You need to learn to be present, ideally as just presence. So the Buddha teaches as follows. He says, when hearing, just hear. When seeing, just see. And the just here implies nakedly or barely. Just keep it at seeing. You see something, stay there. Just seeing. It's just seeing. That's good mindfulness. You have established mindfulness on step one. Your mindfulness is incredibly fast. You can do that. Very good. Step one. Just seeing. But if you miss step one, no problem, there's still step two. And step two is a bit more noisy. It's a bit more easy to catch. And that noisiness of step two is feeling. Either feeling, ah, I don't like it, or, mm, that's nice. Like that. That you can catch it there. Your mindfulness can kick in right there. You can make it your kind of measuring tool. You can make it your alarm bell for mindfulness, your feelings. Let your feelings tell you when your mindfulness needs to kick in. Let's say you're suffering. You have dukkha vedana, which means unpleasant sensation, sensational suffering. That is the case. It's very easy to notice. I, I suffer. Now mindfulness should kick in, actually. Ah, suffering. Now what to do then? Well, nothing. That's good news. You have to do nothing. Just stay quiet and watch. Ah, suffering is like this. Or... Let's say you're having a great time, you're having a blast, feeling fantastic. See a beautiful sunset. Wow, nice. Oh, mindfulness kicks in. Pleasant sensation is like this. Watch it. That is mindfulness. You know what is going on as it is going on without preference. You're not choosing what you want to focus on. You take that what is there right now. What is it right now? Make again, I will make a little pause. Notice what is it that is going on right now? Maybe it's confusion or maybe it's just blankness. Maybe you are trying to search for something to focus on. All of that you can become aware of. You, it's you, just you, unfiltered. No pretense, no trying to be different, simply accepting the way it is. Maybe you're freaking out, you're totally angry, you had a shit day. <laughs> Pardon my language. And you feel, oh my God, I want to feel totally different. Now then take that as the object of your mindfulness. Ah, feeling not good. Even, I'm, I usually don't talk 30 words like this. 
you know me pretty well. Now having said that, having said this word that I just said before, it gave me a very strange feeling. And now I can notice with mindfulness, ah, it's like I'm feeling strange. There's the, immediately after I said the word, it was like there was a thought arising and the thought was I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> that was too harsh. Harsh language. That wasn't good. So I can become mindful of that. You, you notice. So it's not about trying to be some sort of pretentious, perfect little being that's always doing the right thing, always saying the right things. There's nobody is like that. Nobody always says the right thing. Show me that person. Who says always the right thing? <laughs> Impossible, right? So here is our, our chance to accept the way it is. Oh, you feel you messed up. You just said something wrong or you, you shouldn't have thought that and you feel embarrassed, you feel ashamed or um, you feel like you need to lie or something like that. Whatever it is that human beings experience in the human realm, in human interaction, that is our object of mindfulness right there. And feeling is a wonderful playground to train and practice your mindfulness. Oh, how are you feeling right now? Neutral? Pleasant? Unpleasant? How is it? How is it to feel neutral? Does the neutral feeling have a slight tone of unpleasantness? Does it have a slight tone of pleasantness? As mindfulness. And now if you miss that second step, no worries, still have a third chance. But by now, it's already becoming quite intense. You are already very steered up inside. Now this is the beginning of craving. When you're having a pleasant sensation, you want to make it last. You can have the, the energetic tendency to hold, grasp it and hold it. And when it is unpleasant, of course, then the, the energetic sensation is to push it away. And that is where you feel really, really unpleasant already. The holding as well as the pushing are both rather unpleasant. There's nothing pleasant to it. Even holding to pleasant sensation is not really pleasant. It ruins. It ruins the pleasant sensation, in fact. It disturbs it. It is like you're laughing about a joke and someone comes along and says, Yeah, that's right. Keep laughing. I want to make a picture of you. And it immediately ruins the fun. You're like, now you're feeling like a pretense trying to stay laughing, right? <laughs> It doesn't work, it's unnatural like this. Or you're just crying and sad, or poor me, my life is terrible. And then someone comes along and says, yeah, stay like that, keep crying. <laughs> Cry harder, Cry more. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, you can't make it, you can't force experiences. Experiences just arise because there are causes for them. Now when an experience has arisen, is pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, and craving has arisen, we're at step three. You know it because you suffer. There's tension in the body. Tension from holding on. Tension from trying to get rid of. Your bundle of tension already. Now, easy to be mindful there because it's so noisy. So you can remind yourself, oh, there it is, suffering, tension. Now, there's already mindfulness. Mindfulness is very humble and so fast. It's so fast. You don't have to prepare for it. It is right there in this moment as you know yourself as you are. Many people make the mistake to confuse mindfulness with focus. It's not. Mindfulness is not focus. 
You don't have to focus on anything to be mindful. I made the mistake a long, long time on my path to, to um, erroneously assume that mindfulness means to concentrate on something. It gives you headaches because you're holding. So don't hold. Just simply look at yourself. What's going on right now? Is there a blank? A blank is like this. Having a blank is like this. Are you bored? Being bored is like this. See, you are encouraged to explore, to look at yourself. There is absolutely no necessity in the Buddhist training to look at other things. The object of contemplation is yourself, your mind and your body. Just that. In fact, the entire universe consists of your body and mind. Now you might think, well, that's a heavy statement. What is it that sees other people? It's your eyes. What is it that hears the sounds around you? It's your ears. What is it that feels your feet walking on the ground? It's your tactile sense. Now, if you take one by one all those senses away, everything disappears. Everything you know, it disappears. Take away your vision. You do not see other people anymore. You don't see colors anymore. You don't see shapes anymore. You don't see distance anymore. Now take away the sense of hearing. There's no more sounds. Very hard to orient yourself like this. Take away your sense of smell and taste. Then the sense of feeling. So what's there then? Now take away thinking. What's left? That would be deep, deep, deep meditation. The world completely fades, completely disappears, is incredibly peaceful. And only then will you understand that the world, the senses and the mind are such a heavy burden. But only then, only when you have learned to actually let go completely of this world, then you will see just how heavy it is. And even on the process towards that, it already appears to be very heavy. If you can rest more and more on the inside, the world appears more and more as stressful. Constant friction, constant impingement. The senses are constantly impinging on your awareness. Always demanding your attention. Hear that, look at that, do this. It's constant friction all the time. We consider it normal because we know nothing else. We don't know the peace beyond that. It's a tadpole or a frog doesn't know anything else but being a frog. If you tell him how it is like to be a professor at the university, the frog might understand you. Let's say he speaks your language. The frog might understand you but doesn't really understand you at all. It, doesn't, it will never be a professor at a university. Like that. So, our six senses is the level of contact. Keep it at that, best practice. When seeing, just see. When hearing, just hear, etc. 
Train yourself like this. This very good mindfulness. Right now, what is going on in your mind? Is there thinking? Then notice, ah, thinking. Is there worrying? Ah, worrying. There's nothing for you to do here. As the saying goes, the seeing is the doing. Just watch. I watch clearly with open eyes, awake, seeing very clearly. Ah, it arises and it passes. Why do you suffer? You suffer because you think it lasts. But it doesn't. Nothing does. Nothing lasts. Everything you think is so important right now, it is nothing. But we think it's, it's so much because we have no perspective. It's like a, we need to get out a little bit and see from above and zoom out more and more until you see little planet, planet Earth becoming more and more small. You see our nine planets becoming more and more small. You see our galaxy more small and more small and more small. What are your problems really? Just seeing our planet Earth from above with all the wars, all the hunger, all the terror, all the craziness around this world. What are your problems? Zoom out a little bit. We need to get out of ourselves to get a perspective to see clearly, ah, oh, well, it's not, that, it's not that bad and it will not last anyways. Whether it's pleasurable or unpleasurable, how many times did you feel great in your life? How many times have you been so happy in your life, laughing, singing songs, dancing? How many times? And how many times have you felt terrible in your life? Feeling down, feeling, oh my God, will I make it? No one loves me. I have problems. How many times? Countless times. Even every day, every week, there's so many ups and downs. Sometimes feeling fantastic, sometimes feeling down, right? Going up, down, up, down all the time. You know your emotions are breathing. Your thoughts are breathing. Your mind is breathing. Like everything else in this world. Like everything in this universe. We have the big, big bang breathing. <laughs> Contraction, the big crunch, the big bang. That's also like a breathing. Someone posted on Facebook, there's this video of planet Earth. Um, in, t in 12 months, you can see the snow coming on and off. Maybe you've seen it. It just fast forwards, cycles through these 12 months and you see the snow coming and going. It's like breathing. It's like planet Earth is breathing. Everything is cyclic. It breathes. So relax. It's not so important. It's just stuff. We have just learned to take it so seriously, everything. It's not really. What if this was a dream right now? And you would know it. And you wake up from it and you suddenly realize, wow, it's not that important, it's just a dream. I'm just dreaming this. You can never be 100% certain that it is not a dream. I've had dreams where I was 100% sure it's not a dream, but it was a dream. I was in the dream, I was checking if it is a dream. But the dream kind of convinced me it was real. Very easy to get carried away with one's idea that, yeah, it's real, it's, everything is real. What I experienced real, my future, my past, my problems, me and 
my heaviness and my seriousness, all of it is real. And, but it's not really real. And all it takes to look beyond that and through that is a very relaxed, gentle mindfulness, noticing yourself, ah, there it is, feeling, seeing, thinking. Keep looking. See it arise and pass. Get better at this. Every day, every week, every month. Bring in more and more wakefulness and your life will become more and more bearable. Less and less dramatic. Kind of float above more and more. That's the benefit you can expect from good meditation practice. And this is how the trouble of liking and not liking comes to an end. Because liking and not liking only comes when you are not mindful. So Pan was asking, where does liking and not liking come from? It comes from avicca, not knowing, not being mindful. If you're really mindful, it doesn't stand a chance. It just comes and goes. No trouble. Okay, so I think that's good enough for today.